Hi, and welcome to this course on artificial intelligence and the rise of ChatGPT. My name is Ben, I'll be your instructor today. I'm gonna to bring you up to speed on the history of AI. What are these tools? Why are they available now? And how can we use them to improve our lives and make things a little bit easier while also fully understanding the pros, cons, biases, misinformation that may be associated with using these tools. So since the 1950s, what has happened in the world of AI? Well, in the 50s and 60s, it was a very rule-based system and very early on, early computers, early ideas, early testing. Give them a computer, a set piece of information, a formula, a code, and expect that it will know to give a certain output based off of those inputs. But back then, it was still in the very early stages, so very simple inputs and outputs. There was what we call the AI winter in the 70s and 80s, and this is because computers were evolving, but not quite to the point where they could process enough information to make significant gains in AI technology. That started to change in the 90s where computers became really powerful and much more accessible to the common individual. They were cheaper, they were faster, they could process more information. And then fast forward to the 2020s, we have the emergence of large scale machine learning models like GPT, the genesis in the background of ChatGPT that came out in the 2010s and beyond. Some important milestones in AI would be in 1997, IBM's Deep Blue defeated a world chess champion. If you were around back then, you may remember that. It was really uh, big news at the time, the first time a computer had beat a human in any sort of game. And so it certainly set off some ideas of what computers may develop to in the future. In 2011, IBM's Watson, which was the next iteration of Deep Blue, won Jeopardy against human champions, which was another great milestone in computers being able to answer questions in quickly based on speech pattern and human behavior. In 2016, Google's AlphaGo defeated the Go World Champion. This was a really big milestone because if you're not familiar with Go, it is a board game, but it is considered one of the most challenging board games in the world because there are almost infinite moves that can be made and predicted and no one game goes the same way. So to be able to program in all these potential moves in the board game from the beginning was a feat in itself, and then being able to defeat a human who may not make the same move twice was a really big milestone in development in AI. And then in 2021, OpenAI launched ChatGPT, which really set off a lot of the AI conversations that we are having today. Now let's talk about an introduction to ChatGPT, OpenAI, and GPT architecture. You're likely familiar with ChatGPT. Let's dig a little bit more into what it actually is. So GPT, or as we talked about, Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, is a neural network architecture developed by OpenAI. And OpenAI is its own private company, so it's important to keep in mind that when we talk about GPT, we are talking about something developed by a private company called OpenAI. Now, because they are open, they have made this architecture available to anyone to use and to build upon, but they were the ones who developed it. GPT version three is one of the most notable versions and that that was the first time that we were really seeing this AI output human-like responses to the point where you could ask it a question and it could respond like any other human would. That was a huge breakthrough and open the doors to making AI more accessible to the masses as a whole. But it didn't happen overnight. You can see this timeline of uh, OpenAI being founded in 2015 and over the preceding years developing different versions. And as they developed different versions, they fed it more information. It became faster, it became stronger, it was able to answer more questions, it was able to answer more questions quickly and answer them in a more natural way. So now at the end of 2023, we are at version four, which we'll discuss in just a second, but this is a evolution over multiple years to get us to the point where this tool has developed to, uh, uh, to be available to the masses. But again, it did not happen overnight. It took many years to get to that point. GPT-3 launched in 2020. 
At that point, it had been fed 175 billion machine learning parameters, 175 billion inputs of text and blog posts and news article and books and code to be able to start to build this natural learning and this uh, natural language processing. When we got to GPT-3, it was able to respond in coherent text conversations across multiple domains, English, coding, French, software development, you name it. Now at version four, which is where we currently are at the end of 2023, it comes with improvements to all of that. So now we're at the point where we understand what we want these tools to do. We understand if we feed them a question, what we want it to give us as an export and the tool is only getting better at that. As we give it feedback, it learns. And it learns if it's giving you the right information, if it's giving you the wrong information, if it's close, getting closer. The more information it's fed, the better it gets. And opening this up to millions of users allows it to learn faster and faster and faster. So while it took many years to get to this point, future iterations may only come every few months because it has learned so much more in a matter of months than it did in previous years getting to that point. So now that we have something like ChatGPT available, what can we use it for? Well, we know it can develop human-like text and applications, but what are some of those applications? Well, everything from drafting an email or other text, which if you are in a business setting, to be able to draft a long email. If you are a student looking to write a paper, it can be very helpful in doing so. It can also write Python code. If you want to develop a program or if you are coding yourself and you run into an issue and you need help, ChatGPT can help review your code and see if it's working correctly or where there might be issues. It can answer questions about documents. You can create your own chatbot based on ChatGPT. You can give software a natural language interface, which means you can develop software that is easier to read and easier to work with than just the backend code. You can use it as a tutor in a range of subjects, a subject matter expert. And this is just scratching the surface of what we can do with ChatGPT and these human-like AI interfaces. But when we talk about generative AI, we start to talk about things like art like design and photos and having an AI that can make beautiful images for you, go way beyond writing an email or a research paper or even building a piece of software. But we're talking about art and images and bringing AI and our vision to life. So I'm gonna talk about what generative AI is and then show a few examples of some generative AI tools that you can use today. To first understand generative AI, we need to understand what makes this a little bit different from some of the AI tools that we have talked about before. So similar to other AI, it is capable of learning from a set of data and generating new or similar data by understanding and looking for underlying patterns. Looks at patterns, features, distributions, so how can a business use generative AI to support their initiatives? Well, content creation is huge. Think about content creation for social media, for blog posts. If you want to create a new image that you can post online, AI can help develop that instantly as opposed to hiring somebody or going out and taking pictures of something new or finding an artist to do it for you. AI can help you with that. It can also help you with design. Something like designing a presentation, like the one you're seeing here now, ask AI to help design it. And I did use AI to help with this presentation because of course I had to. Personalization, create personalized content for each one of your customers. So you're not sending the same image or the same piece of art to every customer. You can create something new for hundreds or thousands of people. And you can develop new products, services, or solutions. So, there's a lot that you can do as a business in uh, generative AI to help meet some of your business objectives. For individuals, it is much of the same. Art creation to create music or visuals, learning and development for learning and development materials. I use AI to help with the design and some of the content for this presentation that I'm giving. From an entertainment standpoint, you can create new games or environments. You can work on new hobbies. The ideas are essentially endless. Whatever you can think of, 
there is probably an AI solution for it. And AI is great because you may have an idea and you're just struggling to get past that first step of how do I bring it to life? AI can help you do that. So uh, some examples of tools that you can use today include Dolly, which is part of OpenAI, and that creates images by combining various textual descriptions. So you essentially give it a prompt and it will give you an image. ChatGPT, we talked about that already. Runaway ML, a Runaway ML, a creative toolkit that makes AI accessible to creators for various different media. Juke decks utilize AI to create music tracks. So these are just a few examples, but we're gonna take a second to actually go into some of these and show what is DALI and how does it actually help create images and how could you use it with some ideas that you may have today. Okay, let's take a look at Dolly. So as you can see, it's part of OpenAI. Here is the URL. I will put this link in the description as well. But when you log in or when you go to this website, you first click try Dolly and then it is going to ask you to log in before you get to the screen. I have already logged in. I have an OpenAI account. You can create one for free. There are paid versions as well. But once you log in, this is what you get. And if you scroll down, you can see some examples and descriptions of things, Van Gogh style painting of an American football player, a 3D render of an astronaut walking in a green desert. Some interesting things that you can see here, but you can start with anything you want, like a painting of a cat playing poker. I've used cat as an example a couple of times so far. So I feel like we have to take a look at what Dolly comes back with if we ask it for a picture of a cat. So this is what it comes up with. Some examples of paintings of cats playing poker. These are all brand new images. These are not images that you're gonna find anywhere else. They're completely unique. And Dolly created them from scratch based on what it knows about cats, poker, paintings, colors, everything. So let's try something else. A picture of a person hitting a golf ball. Let's see what it can come up with with that type of prompt. I'm a golfer, or maybe I wanna create some golf content for Instagram or for my golf blog. What can it come up with? Well, here are some images. Now we can start to see with images of people, some of them look okay, some of them look a little off. So if we look at this foot, it kind of looks a little weird and the shoe looks a little weird. So, you know, we can say, all right, that's uh, a little off and the golf club is stuck inside the golf ball. So certainly not perfect. Um, this one is maybe a little bit better. This one we have kind of a person, but we have no face on this person. So trying to get it to replicate actual people is kind of hit or miss if it's actually going to deliver. But even this alone is pretty impressive that you can come up with pretty much anything that you can think of. And this program will create it for you from scratch and then you can use these. These are your images to use however you like.